the first the first thing I try to do is um, um, it's not unlike parenting <laughs> where I, you try to set expectations, right? Resources are not unlimited. Budgets are not unlimited. And you got this really <laughs> long list of things to do. And you basically says, OK, tell me your top five. I will go yeah. execute those. You know what I mean? You can't. Yeah. Everything's not free. Uh, from a marketing uh, point of view. So to the best of my ability, I just try to be very transparent and be very intentional on what I'm trying to do and help the sales team. And yeah, you, you know, just like in any other organization between any other functions, you're going to have this nat this natural conflict, which is not, it's not a bad thing. Yeah, you just have yeah. to, you have to be really good at working through what's best for the company. Welcome back to Over a Pint, the podcast that puts the focus on the fast and ever-changing world of marketing. And this is told through the eyes of industry veterans. This isn't theory here. This is real-world practical experience. I'm joined by El Presidente, <laughs> Celtic <laughs> Advertising, Mr. Brian Meehan, Cheers. Partner, partner and vice president of Celtic Advertising, Kurt Lingle, and myself, director of new business development at Acedia, Pat McGovern. Let's get to the show. Guys, start it off with this. What are we having? Richard, yeah. Richard you're our guest. What are we having today? Uh, I'm having Moon Man, um, <laughs> but I'm violating a pretty significant marketing rule by having it in a Milwaukee brewing glass. So I hope I hope nobody's offended <laughs> by that. <laughs> Mr. Lingo, what do you got? You know, uh, Pat, I am um, I'm sticking with the uh, Sheboygan, I'm a big fan of Three Sheeps Brewing, what they're doing. I'm drinking their nitro stout, the uh, Cashmere Hammer. Cheers. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. Nice. Gentlemen, I got a Smittix. I haven't popped the top on it yet, but I will during our conversation. I wanted to send a shout out and kind of a notice to our listeners that our beer fridge is getting low. I just noticed <laughs> today. So if you're a beer brand out there, uh, send us a case over. We'll enjoy it and we'll plug you on our show. Very good. And I still have, again, as I was telling Richard before the show started, I have got to get some new beer myself. And uh, yeah, so I hope uh, who's ever listening gets it over to us quickly. Yeah. Uh, cheers. Cheers, everybody. Today, we're joined by uh, guest Richard Hine. Richard, thank you so much for being on the podcast with all of us. Um, we're going to be diving deep into the world of B2B marketing, which, again, as we were talking, I think is really going through a renaissance. And I think this is where all the action is going to be in marketing for the next three, five, seven years. So, Richard, welcome to the show. Ah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, Richard, let's we always start here, but give the give the millions of fans a little bit of background about yourself <laughs> uh, and, you know, what you do. And, and, and we'll start it there. Yeah, so I have... Um, Gosh, I hate to admit this, 25 plus years of experience in uh, <clears throat> in marketing, product management, market of customer intelligence, VOC, customer research, product launch, pricing. Um, I'm now in my seventh industry and, it ra and they've all been highly technical, um, highly sophisticated, ranging from you know, electronic materials uh, that are made to use circuit boards all the way to uh, grid automation, um, utility protection, uh, automotive, uh, building automation, um, now into somewhat of the educational space. And I've worked for really big companies in big global roles. And I have most recently, I've been working in a smaller uh, manufacturing companies kind of in the Southeast uh, Wisconsin area. Awesome. Awesome. So you've definitely got a lot of experience. You, you, mm. you just talked about all the different organizations that you've worked for and been a part of. Richard, if you could give us a sense as to what's going on, give us the state of state in marketing in the B2B area, right? What's happening there? Um, I think there's, at least for me, and especially over the last five to 10 years, I've definitely seen more of an emphasis on solutions versus like just selling a widget, if you will. 
um, and definitely see more sensitivity to using and developing products and services to actually solve a problem. Um, and I've seen I've seen a lot a lot of good work to align kind of development and marketing around, hey, we're here to help you be successful and really putting yourself in your customer's shoes. I've seen, I've seen a lot of that change um, uh, in the last five to 10 years where if I go back five to 10 years, it was primarily some engineer and engineers don't get mad at me, but some engineer yeah. saying, I've got this really great idea and is all proud of it. But the fact of the matter is the customers didn't really get it or understand it. So it's kind of been that more customer facing than it has been in the past. Well, it's interesting. You know, I've been around just as long as, as you have in the marketing space. And I do remember when I first started, you know, it was engineers that led the meeting. You know, when you came in as the agency, it's like, you're going to meet with the engineering department. They're going to run you through the product. And you'd scratch your head and just sit there and go, well, why did right. you create it? Well, because we thought they'd like it. You know, we know our customers. Right. And boy, has that changed, you know, from 25 years ago to where it was product focused, then it was customer focused. Now it's like community based is how can we work together to solve issues and challenges that you have? It's a big leap for B2B. It, it, it is a big leap. And, you know, when I was leading product management teams, what I would tell the product managers, if you can't, if you can't answer the following question, you probably shouldn't be doing it. And the question is, what problem are you solving? And it usually falls into two things. You need to save them time or money, um, or you do need to solve a problem that they're having. If you can't identify that, you ask yourself what you, why you're spending time on it. Yeah. So what I'm hearing, Richard, is that organizations are just understanding there's a real need for a, a robust marketing department within their organizations. Or am I simplifying things too much? Uh, I think there's I think there's a growing acknowledgement and, you know, it's interesting to me because there still are people when somebody says marketing, mo a lot, a lot of organizations, and I'm just going to say some of more of the smaller ones, they think it's your brochure, they think it's a website, <laughs> they, think it's, they think it's more of the traditional kind of stuff. But when you get into conversations, you stop, you talk a little more strategically about what marketing can help do and deliver, um, then the world of marketing becomes a lot bigger than yeah. just a website and a brochure and some sort mm -hmm. of LinkedIn post, you know. Got it. Yep. Yeah, yep. The, uh, based on the uh, based on the amount of experience that all of you have, I'm I'm new to the game. I'm much younger. I'm a, I'm a newbie. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I do like what you had said earlier, uh, Rich, if I could. Um, you know, it's interesting. You were talking about with your perspective about how you're seeing it. You're seeing the trend go more towards solution based. And I, I like that um, a lot just because, you know, there's always been that that ongoing debate where it's like, you know, B2B, B2C. But, you know, at the end of the day, when you talk about it, it you're in a, if you're providing a solution, you're humanizing your brand, regardless yeah. of who the end user is, and I and I and I like that. It's almost like you're you know you're you're personalizing a little bit, and that's a that's a key thing for any company to understand. Yeah, and it's not you know in your in your everyday life you go through the same process, right? So um, just because you're at work in a B two B manufacturing, you're still dealing yeah. with fellow you know, human beings and people. Amen that you need to relate to. And so your storytelling and how you present it and how you talk to them about trying to help them solve a problem is really important and it resonates with people. It, it, you're, you're, you're more humble, uh, you're more transparent, uh, you're, not, you're not trying to like sell them on something they don't need. You're, you're more genuine as a, as a company and as a brand if you take that approach. Cool. Hey, so Richard, one of the things that connected me with you um, was some of the posts that you've recently published on LinkedIn, where yes. you're talking about customer journey and the importance of that. So I'm going to hit you with a couple of questions. One, Richard, for us and the listeners, why don't you describe the customer journey, uh, just what that is? I'd love for you to, to do that. And then 
how are you trying to work that into the conversation and how receptive are people to that idea? So, a uh, things. well, yeah. yeah, okay. So customer, customer, you know, you can Google customer journey, you can journey mapping, you can Google um, customer experience and you're going to get a very long list of, of, of hits on that. But generally what a journey map is, is basically uh, identifying the experience a customer has with you as they go through the, the journey from becoming aware of you, researching you, interacting with you in terms of, hey, I want to talk to a salesperson or I want to quote or I want to place an order or I get I receive the product, I install the product and what happens when I need help after I purchase. So generally, generally, you know, the, the journey will cover five major stages. It's like mm -hmm. aware, aware, compare, decide, order, deliver, support in general. And then what a journey map exercise does is it goes through and you do research with, with customers and you try to understand what they expect at each one of those stages. How do they feel today about their experience with you in each one of those phases? how they want to feel, so aspirational, how they would want to feel um, through those. And then it identifies moments of truth. And a moment of truth is in a, a transactional experience. Mm -hmm. Let's just, as an example, somebody wants to become aware of you, they do a Google search, they end up on your website, and they can't find what they're looking for. That's a moment of truth because it will okay. create a negative experience. And so there's a couple moments of truth in each one of those stages, and you'll know where you're doing well. You know well you're, uh, you know you will know where you're either not near, not as good or not as bad. You're kind of equivalent to the peers in your space, and then you'll know where people are having a negative experience. And the reason that becomes super important is because then you can align not only your marketing efforts, but your process improvement efforts. And as I've somewhat made the case on LinkedIn, believe it or not, you can align a product strategy based on what you learn from the journey map. Yeah. Pat, I was just gonna say, what I found interesting with the journey map early on was it was generally a marketing function. You know, when we, we, we got to get them into the funnel, when they're in the funnel, we we'll send them an email, we'll send them some case studies. We'll, what I like about the way Richard explains is it's really everything in the organization. Yes. You know, it's, it's marketing, it's sales, it's customer service, it's production, it's uh, installation. All of those pieces have to align from the you know, front of the house to the back of the house. And if they don't, everybody fails, you know, instead of looking totally. at it, just how do I get them in the funnel to create a sale? I like that. It's also, once I have the sale, how are we carrying that uh, customer through the, through the end of the journey? And then back to the beginning again. Yeah. Because the whole idea is it's easier to keep a customer mm. than to get a new one. Right. And customers that are loyal uh, will tend to pay a higher price and give you a bigger share of their wallet. So that's, that's the whole concept. So you've got this core group of customers that you really want to keep happy. And if you keep them happy, they're going to tell other people. And it's just, it's just this, you know, just this snowballing effect. And the other thing, the last thing about a journey map is um, it tells you the key drivers of that loyalty. So um, what you'll get is you'll get, you'll get a perspective of the levers that make people come back, meaning you don't have to fix everything. Um, just because somebody says you're not doing well on price doesn't mean you need to go out and lower your price, right? It's because that's not a key driver of loyalty. So it, it's really interesting because you, know, you might get some negative comments about part of the experience, but that's actually okay if it's not a key driver of loyalty, yeah, you, you know, you might want to help them out and that kind of stuff. But in terms of improvement and mm -hmm. where you spend your time and your money, it really is they'll keep those key drivers you need to focus on. Yeah. You know what? I, what I what I like about the and I think that that was a great um, yeah, you know, summary and great uh, 
talk through, Richard, on, on the customer mapping, what I find interesting is, is it just, you know, you're right, Brian, when you talk about the funnel, it's, you know, the awareness, consideration, purchase, this is full investment in, this is a company making the full investment on that individual. And you're right, it's full integration and it's, it's beyond just the end result. I like how you said that. It's, it's those moments of truth in between where you're constantly checks and balances. And uh, that's easier said than done. I mean, you, you got to really walk the walk to really get that customer or end user or whomever it might be to really drink the Kool-Aid, which is the ultimate goal. I like you said that. It's easier to retain than find a new uh, customer. We want them all to drink the Kool-Aid, but it takes an investment, a full investment all the way through. Yeah, you just you just highlighted something that um, is harder harder than most people realize. So you you described the sales funnel, right? You got to nurture the lead all the way through the sales funnel. A journey map is not that. A journey yeah. map is tracking the interaction somebody has with you through that whole process. So the journey map is not a sales funnel. It's more of a you know. I found you on the web. I want I, I want you to contact me. I requested a quote. Why didn't you get it back to me in like an hour? Why did it take a day? Um, how why did it take you know a week for you to enter the order and give me a confirmation? It's those kind of that those interactions is really what you're measuring because it's the entire relationship across that whole journey. That's that's what I'm that's what I'm advocating for. It's been a huge been a huge help for me um, in my marketing thinking and prioritizing and understanding how marketing can really help companies grow by focusing on those moments of truth. So, you, Richard, you got as you see here, you got a lot of people nodding their heads, right? All mm -hmm. of us are going, "Yep, yep," mm -hmm. right? That makes that makes right. total sense to us. Yep. All that said, how has that been received when you start talking about that within your organizations? I have um, to believe that it's a little bit still like, what are you talking about, man? Yeah, there's <laughs> there's there's definitely some of that. Um, you mean I, I started I I got exposed to this uh, when I was back with Johnson Controls, I don't know, 10, 10 some years ago. And I, I'll be honest with you, I poo pooed it. I'm like, no. I'm a strategic marketing guy. I'm not doing customer satisfaction work. That's just not, not who I am. What I realized was the power of the data and the power of the documentation mm -hmm. and um, being able to align improvement efforts that has a real positive impact. And so, you know, the measurements that come with this kind of philosophy is you have a loyalty score, you have an MPS score, you have an ease of doing business score, and you're able to see the changes you make, and some of them are little changes, some of them are big changes. You can see that score go up or down, and that's that's really what's important. But there has been a mix, right? This is this is this is not an easy conversation for somebody to wrap their head around. Right. Um, but when I was at when I was at Metal Era, what I really advocated for was identifying and documenting and validating some of the key pain points in the process and being able to align process improvements around there because that business was all about speed. It was all about ease of doing business. And there were there from the quote to the order phase was a huge pain point. And that's where we right. focused our efforts. So yeah. um, like I said, you don't have to do everything, but yes, this is not something easy to grasp when you've not been exposed to it before. Yeah, for sure. Hey, for Richard, sure. who owns the, who owns this process? I mean, we're all nodding our heads. We all think this is great, but this is certainly a time commitment. So I'm wondering, is there a consulting firm that comes in that, you know, third party agnostic and kind of leads you through it? Is it driven from marketing? Is it driven from upper management? What's the time commitment to this as well? Well, so in my experience, it's always been a combination of upper management support generally led via the marketing organization. It's okay. so the way it was at Johnson Controls, the way it was at Metal Era. It's probably the way it's going to be in my new role uh, if we get there. Um, in terms of time commitment, there are plenty of consultants and third parties that you can you can partner with to do this for you. I I personally would recommend when you do the journey map, you actually have a third party do it because you'll get that non biased interaction mm -hmm. with customers. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but the rest of it, the rest of it is just, you know, all internal and making, it's like product development. I have a process improvement. I have this idea. I know what the impact's going to be. Here's my business case. Here are the resources. Kind of yay or nay, do you want to make the investment in it? So it's not, okay. it's not that different than justifying the development of a new product. Yeah, you know what's interesting, Brian? I, it, it, that was going to be my question, too. It's, um, I go back to what I said earlier. I, you're right, Pat. We're all nodding our heads. It, it's an investment. However you, you know, you, you it identify is. It's whether it's time, money, and I think it's a it's a great idea. And what I like about having some outside counsel, and I, I hear what you're saying, it's you've got to own it internally, but it does it keeps you accountable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's kind of why clients hire an outside agency. That's part of our job. It's it's above and beyond just you know what do you need today? I need a website. I need a video. It's like great. You know, we're not just order takers. We're also there to counsel and sometimes have those you know, healthy conversations. I think that's important for someone to kind of help, you know, an organization be somewhat accountable because it probably can be hard. That, that would be my guess. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. You know, when we, when we take a look at all of this or what I'm hearing too, is when you roll that all up together, what that kind of ladders all up to is your brand, right? How easy it is to do work with you, how, you know, your NPS yeah. score, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. But unfortunately, um, we were talking about this earlier. It, and unfortunately, I think when people, especially in the B2B space, traditionally have thought of brand and their brand is this is our brochure. Oh, you want this is the you know, this is the and it's just so much. It's so much more than that. Yes. Um, Richard, along the just lines of, of branding elements and so forth, one of the areas that's very interesting to me is just the, the B2B outlook and overview, again, typically on websites. Give me your take on how B2B organizations traditionally kind of look at the website and the role that plays in the overall mix and how, um, maybe, and how that's evolving. Yeah, so I, I think traditionally, and again, it depends, it depends on, not, not, every, not everyone thinks this way. And I, it's, it's really hard to, to give you kind of a broad generic answer because there's so many different things, but in general, in the B2B space, especially in highly technical industries, the website tends to be more of an online repository for technical documentation. You know, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna, I need to find this installation manual or I want a sell sheet or I want, I want something that's got all of the data I need. Um, and I, I think for me, I think that's evolving and and it's evolving in a way where we're now having, at least I have over the last couple of years, now having conversations around, you know, when you have a, when you're a B2B manufacturer and you're a marketing person, you can't treat your entire audience like they're one homogeneous audience. Let me give you an example. So if you're, if you're in commercial construction, you have influencers of uh, people that will make decisions on whether they buy or specify your product. That could be an architect. That could be a consultant. That could be a contractor. Well, guess what? All three of those are very different and how you speak to them are very different. The data they're looking for is very different. Mm, totally. And so, um, you know, the last couple places I've worked at is when people come to the website, they were not acknowledging their audience. There was not a home for an architect. There was not a home for a consultant. There was not a home for a contractor. So I think there's a growing awareness of the importance of understanding who your audience is and then aligning how you talk to that audience so that you can help them in the decision-making process. And their decision-making is very different. That's awesome. Um, let me switch a little bit, Richard. And one of the areas that's really uh, another area that's really fascinating to me is the the interaction, or a lot of times the lack of interaction between sales and marketing. Right? Most again, a lot of B two B organizations have relied heavily on the sales function. Right? We talked about sales. Yeah, funnel. that's yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, I'll just be honest with you. I've I've not really had a huge uh, issue like 
interacting with sales. Um, I've always taken the approach as a marketing person, um, rightly or wrongly, people may agree or disagree with me, uh, that's okay. Um, I tend to be the kind of marketing person where I'm standing behind the salesperson and making them look like a hero. Mm. Um, I, I don't need a, I don't need the marketing team to be out front and forward. I'd rather have the salesperson be that voice of the cust of the of the company. Um, I think we're the we're the kind of where the the nitty gritty kind of tactical conflicts are. Yeah. You know, sales sales are rapid fire. I need this 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 and this. Marketing's more wait, stop. What's your, <laughs> they're a little slow, a little more thoughtful, a little more, I need to know what you're asking me so I can help <laughs> deliver it. And I can't do it in like an hour. Uh, so it's a little more planned out. Mm -hmm. That's the natural friction that I've always seen between sales <laughs> and marketing. So Richard, to help to kind of connect, make that connection and have that kind of good working relationship, which I'm hearing is, what have you, how did you, like, how did you approach that? How did you build those bridges with the within the organizations? Well, the first the first thing I try to do is um, um, it's not unlike parenting, <laughs> where I, you try to set expectations. Right, resources are not unlimited, budgets are not unlimited, and you got this really <laughs> long list of things to do. And you basically says, okay. Tell me your top five. I will go yeah. execute those. You know what I mean? You can't. Yep. Everything's not free uh, from a marketing uh, point of view. So to the best of my ability, I just try to be very transparent and be very intentional on what I'm trying to do and help the sales team. And yeah, you, you know, just like in any other organization between any other functions, you're going to have this nat this natural conflict, which is not it's not a bad thing. Yeah, you just have yeah. to. You have to be really good at working through what's best for the company. Yeah. Awesome. Richard, just kind of changing gears a little bit. I'm, I'm curious about just the, the state of uh, the state of the union and B2B, as Pat said, but the current economic climate we're working in, you know, we're coming out of COVID. We know it was a challenging year for a lot of people and a lot of businesses. What are you seeing today um, in the B2B spaces as we recover from COVID and have to deal with uh, what? rising lumber costs and gas shortages and and shipping delays from China. What's kind of going on out there? Uh, well, I, I can definitely confirm uh, supply chain issues yeah. and um, hiring people is are by far, by far. It was it was that way. It was that way at Metal Era. It's that way at Palmer Hamilton. <laughs> it's just it's it's unbelievable. And the orders are through the roof. Um, and the thing, the thing that are that's interesting about where I'm at right now, um, there's a flood of stimulus money that's going to be dumped on the schools here in the not too distant future, right? So from a marketing point of view, um, I mean, my two weeks in, I'm like, we've got to get ahead of the game. We've got to be ready. What are we doing to plan? for what could be six to 18 months of really high demand, really high mm -hmm. uh, requests. How are we gonna plan for all of that? And what do I do from a marketing point of view to make it really easy for somebody to go through that, that journey to get to a quote and order phase? So that's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking about. I'm sure I'm not alone. Uh, I, other marketing professionals I'm sure are dealing with very similar things. Yeah, from the people we talk to, your message is very consistent. <laughs> Everybody's concerned about supply chain. Everybody's concerned about hiring. Um, I mean, I guess those are good problems to have, but it's certainly a challenge when you're trying to run a business. Yeah, well, I'd actually, actually, I would say they're they're not good things to have because when I, for, from my head, talking customer experience, uh, you know, if we don't get the people, we don't, don't get the materials, we don't get the product to where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, you know, there's there's going to be some unhappy customers. Yeah, your journey map just got more challenging, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. Richard, you know. quick, quick question for you. Let's, let's stick on that for a second. You know, it's, there are certain things you can control and there's certain things you can't control. And, um, you know that is what we're hearing, right? It's it's hiring, it's it, it's getting people to to fill those positions. So from a recruitment 
marketing perspective, because we, we have a lot of conversations with, with clients ourselves. It's kind of the same thing. It's like, hey, we need to, we need to fill manufacturing spots and we're trying to, you know, we're, we're developing recruitment marketing initiatives to help those manufacturers in many cases. From a recruitment marketing perspective, controlling what you can control, what are what um, what is your approach, or what are you thinking is your approach, or how are you going about it? How are you going about addressing that challenge? Oh, like helping, helping, helping brand and market the company to to get people to apply and mm -hmm. you know get hired. Um, yeah. I'll I'll be honest, I haven't really done much yet in my current role. But I can tell you from past experience, um, very intentional partnership with the HR department, uh, wow. creating a bunch of messaging, creating you know uh, target information that goes to universities or tech schools or high schools, um, working pretty hard on making sure job descriptions are very clear, the boilerplate for the company's clear, the website. Wow is easy to use all of that kind of stuff is uh, the role i've played in the past that's great that you're involved we've talked to some companies where they're very siloed hr just does what they want to do and we do what we i love when marketing gets engaged to help promote the brand um mm -hmm. help help sell the experience and then help with targeting you know because it's you can get lost out there it's like you got to really define that market and hit them strong and hit them hard mm -hmm. totally. God, you know, guys, just listen to us talk here. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. It's like, hey, is the company going to be around? Hey, what's going to happen? Hey, we have to lay off people. It's it's really rough to, like, Richard, what you just said right now is, how do we capture every single dollar that's out there? And there's a lot of dollars that are out there. Now, this there is the biggest problem, right? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I mean, gosh, I mean, that, it's, it's a big problem, and it's a huge shift for, for so many of us. It's just so crazy, these times. And how quick it happened. It, Exactly. Yeah, it's a case exactly. very, very fast. You know, yeah. at, at Metal Era, uh, we started to see the impact on raw materials probably before the end of the year. Okay. Um, I think we did our first price increase like right before Christmas. But after that, it was like rapid fire. It's, it's crazy how I've never seen anything like it <laughs> ever. Yeah. So, Richard, you're in a new position now. And... Um, You've, you're facing all of these challenges that we, we've just talked about. How do you look at developing the marketing department? Like, what are the who are the people? What are the strengths? What are the the talents that you have to bring in? Uh, and again, this isn't maybe a, in a perfect world because you know budgets are always you know a, a real factor. But how do you kind of how do you shape a department mm. that could react to this? Well, so um, that's a great question and. I, I like to think I practice what I preach. So I'm I'm trying to assess where the business is, what the biggest needs are. And obviously there's things that are pretty low hanging fruit and need to be done and now with some sense of urgency. Um, an example, I talked to you about, you know, the stimulus money. A lot of that's gonna go to STEAM and STEM spaces. Uh, specifically, there's language in the stimulus bill that targets that kind of stuff. So how do I help the company get ahead of the curve and get ready for it? That's an immediate thing that doesn't take, a, you know, a lot of research to figure out, hey, we got to jump on this, right? Um, but longer term, it's more around aligning the brand, presenting the brand, uh, figuring out how sales talks to customers, who do they talk to, how do they talk to them. So all of the kind of stuff that I talk about, audience persona development, brand alignment, storytelling, um, in addition to all of the tactical stuff that has to be done to support all of that. And then, and then the, the other part of it is looking at product development, service development, what that schedule looks like, uh, when it's going to be launched, how it's going to be launched, who it's going to be launched to, and an entire calendar. So I'm a big advocate of having a year-long content calendar mm -hmm. where everything's laid out. You know what you're going to say, when you're going to say it. You sit back, you look, and you know the stories you're telling. There's a common thread. There isn't a bunch of disjointed messages and posts that don't make any sense, aren't related to it, each other. So I'm a big plan. I'm a big advocate of that. It works really well. It makes content creation a lot easier because mm -hmm. you know 
you know what you want to say, when you want to say it, and you have some time to develop it. So um, I don't know if I specifically answered your question, but that's that's essentially what I'm getting my hands wrapped around yeah. at this moment. Yeah. You know, you know, Richard, I, I appreciate, you know, you answered up. We bombarded you with a few questions <laughs> just now, and I was just absorbing what you were saying. I appreciate your responses, and I, you know, I, it, I'm hearing some some consistency. You know, you you're a big believer in in playing long ball and building those schedules out. And I and I like how you think. You know, we um we all heard during COVID last year, 2020, that the big thing was for brands don't stay dark. You know, there was this want to kind of like, hey, let's just hide under the desk. And I understood why some might have wanted to do that, but that would have been the worst thing you could possibly have done. And now as we move into 2021 and almost halfway in, you know, there are some that are taking the same approach where it's like, geez, you know, it's like the, that pent up demand is caught up with us. We're so busy. I, I'm okay if we're dark. It's the worst thing you can do. And I, you know, as I'm listening to you just talk through what your end game is and it's like, no, we, we have to figure out that balance and how we keep the brand alive. And it's, it's great. And I, uh, even when you answer the recruitment marketing question you you know some of the things you were talking about how you want to approach it in my from my perspective we're killing two birds with one stone you know you were talking about things that you can do to directly recruit but some of those other things but at the same time they were foundational too right exactly yeah so i my philosophy and again others may or may not agree with me my philosophy is has really been developed such that I think any good B2B marketing person is thinking a year from now, two years mm-hmm. from now. Because mm-hmm. the fact the fact of the matter is um, somebody who expects marketing to have an impact in 30 days <laughs> really doesn't understand the thought and the, the long ball, as you say, that goes into looking at influencing uh, influence the sales funnel. That is a long ball ongoing. It's not an event. It doesn't take place in 30 days. It's a sustained effort over time. So I'm thinking a year from now, like my vision is what do I want this thing to look like a year from now? And what do I need to do today to make that happen a mm. year from now? All right. All right. Um, here's a question for you, Richard. And this wasn't this was something I was reading recently. I just uh, there was a new um, study out uh, on the tenure of CMOs that it's right now, it's currently the shortest it's been in the last 10 years, mm-hmm. right? At about, uh, I wanna say, I, and I could be wrong, 22 months, something in, in that area. Mm-hmm. With the same companies though, the CEO's tenure, it's the highest it's ever been. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the question that I have is for you and just your perspective is why, why is that? I've got some thoughts, but I, I just like to hear from you if you've got any Oh, <laughs> uh, well, I sort of live that kind of example, and I, I it kind of resonates with me. Um, you know, I, I don't have, honestly, I don't have a good answer other than the fact that, you know, certain things, certain things around marketing in the business to business world really haven't changed all that much. And in my perspective, specifically on this topic, Usually marketing is the first thing to go. Um, it's Sometimes it's the last thing to get hired, but it's also the first thing to go. And um, rightly or wrongly, but that's just been my experience. I only can speak from my experience, but I, that's sure. just the, my personal opinion is it, it's pretty easy to say I can live without marketing for a little while um, because it seems like it's, it's almost still viewed as a disposable resource and it's not yep. viewed as a strategic partner. Um, that would be the, that'd be my biggest, my biggest observation and my biggest advice to B2B companies is don't think about marketing in such a short term manner, because it's a very much a longer term strategic kind of role if done correctly. Yeah. You know, from an agency standpoint, um, we have wonderful clients. That's not a criticism of anybody, but I have noticed that the demand is, okay, for every dollar I spend in uh, May, I better get a return by June. 
and yes. we're going to have a we're going to have a CEO executive meeting where you're going to come in after three months of doing something and show us how it's connected to the bottom line. And that's a challenging place to work in. I mean, it just is. And you can disclaim it as much as possible, but you're just not going to get the results you're looking for. And I think it's just a matter of not how much patience do people have. You know, does the CEO get it and understand that it's going to take time and wants to invest? Or is marking overhead takes too long and doesn't get me a sale? Uh, that's that's the challenge we see. I would agree with that. And I would argue those kind of metrics, I think, are important, but they're not the end all be all set mm -hmm. of metrics for marketing. So one of the reasons I advocate for customer experience and like a loyalty score and an ease of doing business score it's pretty easy for me to track the growth of that loyalty score and the improvement of that ease of doing business score. And I can tie that directly to growth in revenue. Mm. It works every single time. I've not experienced, I'm sure there are, but in my experience, correlation being highly correlatable, growing loyalty score, improving ease of business, do ease of doing business score, Revenue's going up every yeah. single time. Yeah, that's awesome, Richard. Um, my final question for you is: is this? Is we've talked a lot about how crazy the marketing, how fast paced it is, the the spaces is, is. How do you stay on top of things? Like, what are the books that you read? What are the podcasts beside this one that you listen to? What do you <laughs> What do you do? Um, I actually spend most of my time online researching. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I, one of the reasons I started the LinkedIn, uh, set of commentary a couple of weeks ago is I really want to engage with people on the topic of being a customer advocate. What does it mean? How can you use that to improve a business? I started that because I was, I was reading a lot of information around the importance of B2B marketing people being that kind of customer voice, bringing it the voice of the customer mm. inside uh, to the organization. And it's, it, it's, it's a different, it's different than a salesperson bringing the customer voice in. The two are sales and marketing's view of a customer voice is very different as they should be. I'm not saying they, they shouldn't be, but mm. for me as a marketing person, I'm going to see things a salesperson is not going to see uh, just by the nature of the role. So um, that's how I do it. Um, I'm not reading any particular book. I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin. I uh, mm. read his blog every day, um, really like his approach to things. But beyond that, I'm, I'm just doing a lot of networking. I'm doing a lot of individual conversations and a, a lot of stuff online. Awesome. Richard Hine, thank you so much for your time here today on the podcast. Um, Richard, you've got the last word. So if you want people to reach out to you, where do they find you? Ah, yeah, you can find me yeah. at uh, Richard Hine on LinkedIn. Um, I've got, I'm really happy with the engagement I'm getting lately on LinkedIn. That's great. Uh, so, you know, connect with me. Let's start a conversation. I want to thank you guys for the honor of being on here. It's been a pleasure and uh, I really appreciate appreciate the opportunity. So thank you very much. Thank Thanks you, Richard. Thank you, yeah, Richard. It's been great. Cheers. You. Cheers. <laughs>